I love that video so much. I've watched it so many times now, and I remember the very first time I watched it, I just got chills up and down my spine. You know, each of the weeks of this series that we've been doing, we've been hearing a little bit more, a little bit more of Marsha's story. And when I realized that I was so lucky that the week I get to preach, it's that video, I was like, yes, this is so good. Because in all honesty, she just preached the sermon. Like one thing I could do is I could say, all right, everybody, let's just quiet ourselves. We're going to watch that video three, four more times, take some notes. Bye-bye. Have a great week. Happy Sunday. Because in that sermon is, is man, there's so much trust. There's vulnerability. There is community that comes around her and, and, and in her coworkers and in her family and in her friends, loving her and caring for her and lifting her up to God and, and the tenderness that Jesus has for her. You know, there's a couple quotes that she says throughout this video that really stuck with me. She says, God showed up with his people to show me love. I love that. She's asking God to be there for her, to help her in such a difficult, difficult season. And and she can see and she can perceive that God did love her and did show her love. But how did he do it? Well, he chose to send and work through his people. And she could see their care for her and the way that they would physically meet needs but also be praying for her. And she could see that both that was them and their faith uh, towards her, but, but also that is the tenderness and love and compassion of God at work in her heart. What a beautiful phrase. Then she says, they're spending their time and investing their relationship with God on my behalf. That sentence right there is an amazing description of what Paul talked about last week, this word intercession. The idea of what it is when we pray and we take up the burdens of somebody that we care for, we we lift this burden up for them to God. We pray on their behalf. Look at how beautiful this is. They spend their time, invest their relationship with God on my behalf, this relationship that had been cultivated with God. It's beautiful. They're going to the highest power that they can go to for me. That's a big deal. And yes, it's a very big deal. Marsha's story is full of the people of God praying boldly and interceding on her behalf. When they do that, they're calling on God to do what they know he most desires to do, asking him to fulfill his promises to overcome evil with good. That video is a masterclass on that word intercession. I want us to take a moment and think of all the ways we see God answering prayer throughout that story. First thing that comes to my mind is peace and comfort. When she's in what must have seemed like one of the darkest, most painful seasons of her life, and I'm sure that there were moments where where that threatened to take over, and yet God fills her with this peace that surpasses understanding. And, And he comforted her, and he sent people around to comfort her. How beautiful. There's an answer to prayer in that Jesus invites her to just rest at his feet and experience his love, how tender, how caring. And then there's the power of God moving in her body and bringing about physical healing and restoration. There's so many answered prayers. And you know, every one of those prayer warriors in that story, the coworkers, the family, the friends, they took Jesus at his word. They believed that prayer really makes a difference in what does or does not happen. They believed that God chooses to include us, to include you, to include me in his work. That not only does he hear our prayers, but that our prayers can move his heart to action. Do you you see the difference there? That's a profoundly different thing. If all he did was hear, then he could, he could say, I see what you're going through, and, and I'm sorry that you're going through it. But know that his heart is one that wants to move, that wants to heal, that wants to restore and to redeem. That's beautiful. That's powerful. And that's a work that he has called and invited us into. These friends came before the throne of God in boldness, and then they trusted him with the results. And this is what we so desperately want to see here at Jacob's Well, what we hunger for our congregation. Can you imagine if our church was known for this, if our church was known for being bold in prayer, for seeing mountains in front of us and saying, you know what, my God can move that, and I'm going to pray fully trusting that he can do absolutely anything. 
Can you imagine the strength and the power if we were seen as people who would, who would see somebody else's suffering and struggles and really do life with them and comfort them and be a part of it and, 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 and both be able to be there in the moment of trial and suffering but at the same time appealing to our God, appealing to his goodness, appealing to his plan. This is what we are hungering for at Jacob's Well and I want you to know it is happening. The last couple of weeks we've been watching stuff. We've been watching some beautiful things happen. Um, uh, vulnerability in prayer. We, we've been having these prayer teams available up in front at the end of services. Some of the things that people are expressing and, and bringing to the table is so encouraging and so powerful, sometimes so painful, yet we see the beauty in it. We see the beauty in people striving with God for things that maybe he hasn't answered yet, but they're believing and they're trusting in his character and his goodness. We're seeing it. We're seeing power and so I think this series that we're in right now is inviting us to consider what do we believe about this. So we have been studying these incredible moments throughout the book of Acts where the people of God cry out in prayer. And over and over again, the Holy Spirit responds powerfully. So much so that it says that the place these people were meeting is shaken, that the foundation is shaken. And my question for you, you today, my question for myself today, do we still believe that this can happen? Do we still believe that our God wants to shake this place, that he wants to wake us up, that he has plans and intentions? What about right here? What about our church? Do we believe that we could be changed? What about the Chippewa Valley? Do we believe that God could shake this place, that he could wake us up, that he could surprise us? Like Pastor Paul said last week so beautifully, this longing that there would be a spiritual awakening in our church that will come and shake us and that the watching world would take notice. So if you're hungry for this, if, if we're ready for this church, if we're ready to see God move us and stir us in ways that maybe we haven't been ready for in the past, then let's enter into prayer right now and let's ask our God to be strong in how he moves Father, we welcome you, Jesus. Thank you for being here. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence. God, we're so grateful for how you have already shown your strength and your might. I want to thank you for every individual who has taken um, the real vulnerable risk to come and pray with other people to lift up the hardest things going on in their hearts and their lives because they believe that if they do this in faith, God, that you, that you will move, that you will bring comfort, that you will bring peace, that you will bring healing, that you will bring answers. God, I pray for an awakening, and it's the kind of thing that we can't manufacture or force. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and show us your power and your might. Wake us up, in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, we're going to dive into Acts chapter 16. At this point in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul is on his second missionary journey with a guy named Silas, and they're revisiting the churches that they had planted up before. They're in modern-day Syria, modern-day Turkey, and the plan is go find these little gatherings of believers and encourage them, build them up, make sure that they're doing okay. That's the game plan. So they're going to these places they'd already been when all of a sudden they didn't see it coming, in the middle of the night, God gives a vision to Paul. And in this vision, there's a man over in northern Greece, and he is calling out to Paul, and he says, please come here. Will you please help us? When Paul wakes up, he's like, okay, that was God. God's calling us to go to this new place, so we're going to be faithful. We're going to go. But this is no small thing. You see, this is the farthest that the gospel has ever spread up until this point. We're talking about literally crossing into a brand new continent, the continent of Europe. But they're faithful and they say, okay, if God's sending us, let's go. So they travel, then they arrive in the city of Philippi. And when they're there, God is about to perform some signs and wonders, some miracles to welcome a whole new people group into his kingdom. This is something we see over and over again in the book of Acts. Is, is, We've got to remember that the church at this point is very young right? Jesus has ascended into heaven. The day of Pentecost came. The people were filled with the Holy Spirit. They've got their mission. They're starting to act out their mission. And the first people who come to know Jesus are Jews. They're people who had studied the Old Testament. They knew about this coming Messiah, and, and, and God does a miracle in them, and they come to know Jesus, and they're welcomed into the family. And miracles happen as they are welcomed in. It's beautiful. 
But then God surprises everyone and he expands that circle beyond just the Jews in Jerusalem and all of a sudden some Gentiles start to believe in God. These are people who are, have no Jewish background. They don't know the Old Testament. They, these are the people that were considered outside of the family of God, far from God, yet they're being filled with the Holy Spirit. Yet they're coming to know Jesus and their lives are being transformed. And so these early, this early church is like, what's happening? We didn't see this coming. They have all these conversations and they're like, all right, God, cool. Clearly this is you. So we're going we're gonna to welcome them into the family. And when they're welcomed into the family, we see signs and wonders as God uh, ushers them, as he welcomes them in, as he kind of takes that to go alongside the power of the truth of the gospel and, and, and welcome them. And so we keep seeing this throughout the book of Acts. It starts small and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yet at this point of the story, they're about to cross into this new continent, go over to the land of Greece. Big things are about to happen. But before we get there, this passage that we're about to read begins with a really important warning. And I want to make sure we give this the time that it needs. And it's as relevant to you and I today as it was to them 2,000 years ago. If we are willing to be bold in following Jesus, to take him at his word, then we need to be aware that there will be opposition. We see this in Acts 16, 16. It says, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer... We met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. So track what's going on. They're in Philippi. They're going to just go and pray, just to spend time with God to kind of to kind of focus before they keep doing their work. But on their way, the slave girl who has a spirit, an evil spirit, a demon inside of her, it gives her the ability to tell the future. Okay. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Miracle, power. There's a lot going on here. What is all happening? Christians, we have to understand that you and I, we have a real enemy, and there is real opposition. We're talking about the evil one. We're talking about Satan, the devil. And we have to be careful because I think in our culture, even within Christian culture, sometimes we talk about Satan as if he's a fairy tale character. Like we, we don't talk about him very often, but the Bible is very clear. In fact, do you know who the person is that talks about Satan the most, is the most clear about his reality and his existence? It's Jesus, literally the creator, literally the son of God who knows his adversary, was very honest about his reality. And Satan's whole purpose is when he sees God gaining territory and moving and breaking through, he tries to stop it with everything he's got. So in this story, we've got these men. We got Paul, we have Silas. They've also invited a couple other important people from the New Testament. This is the part of the story where Paul meets Timothy from First and Second Timothy, and he invites him on the journey. Also, Luke, the author of the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke, is, is now part of this. So these four guys are together on this journey. And God has placed a calling on them, on their lives, to establish his church, to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, to bring light into the darkness. But on their way to pray, Satan uses this demon-possessed girl to try and stop their mission, to convince them to quit. Now, I want you to notice that this evil spirit inside of her does something interesting. It, it uses a true statement to try to manipulate them, right? It's shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God. True. And they have come to tell you how to be saved. True. What's going on here? We actually see examples of this all throughout the Gospels. Almost every time Jesus encounters a demon, they say something like this. But the story that really comes to my mind is the story of Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Do you remember this story? This is right before Jesus is about to begin his public ministry. And he goes into the wilderness for 40 days and he's not eating anything. And it's this time of trying and preparing his heart for what's about to come. And Satan there begins to tempt Jesus. And how does he do it? With truth with scripture. He quotes the promises of God to Jesus, but twists it, tries to get him to, to, get, to get manipulated, tries to get Jesus to turn away from his purpose. And the same thing is happening here. This demon is twisting the truth in order to frustrate, disrupt, and ridicule their mission, trying to get them to give up. 
This is so important for us to hear today because as a church, we are asking Jesus to teach us how to pray. We're asking Jesus to bring us to deeper levels of boldness, of radical faith, really, really putting ourselves all out there with God. And when we begin to take prayer more seriously, I say it again, when we are brave enough to pursue the calling that God has placed on your life and on my life, we should expect resistance. And why? Well, we've been saying that prayer really has the potential to impact the world. It has the potential to see more of God's kingdom come to earth, and Satan hates that. You know, sometimes we, we might think like, well, you know, in my life, I haven't really felt any, any spiritual attacks or I haven't experienced opposition. And, and I think there's a good reason for that, because when we're living the kind of faith that is really, really tame, the kind of faith that isn't inviting other people along on the journey and sharing the gospel, the kind of faith that isn't praying boldly and asking God for big, audacious things, the kind of faith that is just very to ourselves, then maybe we, maybe we don't feel or experience the evil one trying to stop us because he doesn't see us as a threat. But when we start to take God seriously, every one of you, myself included, every one of us has a calling that God has on your life to make a difference for the kingdom. And when we start to live into that, that's when we see the enemy begin to double down. Now, as this is happening, what does the Apostle Paul do? Well, he commands that spirit. He, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and instantly it left her. This power in praying in the name of Jesus, okay, we got to understand this. This is an incredible gift that Jesus himself gave us. He told his, us, Christians, he told his followers to pray in my name because something powerful happens when we pray in Jesus' name. We are praying by the authority, the purity, the holiness and power of Jesus himself. Paul's not trying to cast out a demon by his strength by his spiritual, you know, all the time that he's earned from studying. No, no, no. He's saying, by the strength and might and power of Jesus come out of her, and that demon had to obey. As a staff, we've been going through a prayer study, um, and we've, it's been uh, putting on by John Mark Comer, and he has just said some wonderful phrases about praying in the name of Jesus that I wanted to bring out today. Essentially, there's, there's two aspects to this. The first one is this aspect of how it changes our identity where we begin to realize that we are in Christ. And when we realize that we are in Christ, we come as sons and daughters, not as beggars off the street. We've been adopted into the family through Christ. This is something that Jesus has invited us into, that he wants us to take part in, that he has emboldened us to do. We come in the name and authority of King Jesus with access to the full resources of his kingdom. There is power, there is might in the name of Jesus. But the other aspect that it does is this, that praying in Jesus' name also brings us into alignment with Christ. We ask for the kind of things that Jesus himself would ask for if he were in our situation. You see, it's this beautiful thing as we begin to pray in Jesus' name. The more time that we spend with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we start to become more like him. And as we become more like him, we start to pray for the very things that Jesus so wants to do in our world. And do you know how much he delights when his children want to partner with him in the very things he's ready to move in? We see power. We see might. We see miracles. There is power in the name of Jesus. But the enemy hates that. And we see that in verse 19. So her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. Remember, there's these people who had this slave girl, and she, because of the, the evil spirit, she could tell fortunes. They were making a bunch of money. Now a miracle happens, and they're out of money. So what do they do? They grab Paul and Silas and drag them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. So a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. I just want to pause for a moment. Let's try to imagine that we're them, okay? Just put yourself in the shoes of Paul and Silas. Can you imagine what they must have been going through? What's happening in their heads and their hearts? See, they had been trusting God 
following this calling that he had made so clear for them. Paul received this vision to bring the gospel to Greece, and so they're being faithful, and here they are. They're trying to take him at his word. First, they get attacked spiritually, but then a miracle happens and the demon's gone. Maybe they thought, okay, great, we made it through that, through that experience. And now they're being persecuted by the very people that they've come to help. Can you see how the evil one is doing everything in his power to break them, to convince them this is too hard? Maybe they should just let somebody else do it. Have you ever felt that way about what God's calling you into? I have. Maybe it's too hard. Maybe this is a job for somebody else. But these early Christians, this early church, they were not so easily fooled. You see, they had seen the power of God with their own eyes. We're we're talking miracles. We're talking people that were far from God coming to know Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, chains of addiction and oppression broken. Many of these early followers of Jesus had seen the resurrected Jesus. Like they saw him. They knew that he was, they saw the crucifixion. They knew that he was dead, that he was buried. And then wait, now he's here again. Can you imagine how bold and transformative your faith would be seeing the resurrected Jesus? And for those that hadn't, they had their own experiences with him and they knew so many friends and people that they really trusted. They had real reason to lean into this, to believe this, to put their weight on this. They knew what it was like also to experience the tenderness of the presence of God. And they also had the warnings of Jesus, and so do we. We see this in John 15. This is Jesus talking. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. Persecution, suffering, it's part of it. Following Jesus is never meant to be a path to easy, simple, safe, but it is the path to transformation, to power, eternal life. Despite everything that these men had gone through, they never lost sight of the goal that was set before them. And you know, we've been spending a bunch of time talking about what's hard, right? Opposition and the enemy trying to, to, to attack them, trying to stop them from their mission. And that's all real and it needs time to really sit with. But here's the thing. Something beautifully simple is about to happen. And everything is about to change in verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. What was their response to persecution, beatings, just just blind hatred? It was to pray, and it was to sing. After all the chaos, all the threats, all the violence, right? These early Christians were constantly in danger. The temptation to give up, to choose an easier life, a safer life, must have been so strong, so present. But yet here they are in this inner dungeon praying and singing. They've got got chains on their feet. They're broken. They've been ridiculed. They're stuck in the inner dungeon. But here's the amazing thing. They were absolutely convinced that it was worth it. Please listen closely. These men knew what they were fighting for, who they were fighting for. Their lives had been transformed by the risen Christ. The gospel was not just a nice teaching to them. Jesus was not just a pleasant teacher where if you follow some of his ways, then maybe your life will be a little bit better. No, they understood that this was death and life, that this was transformation, that this was no hope for eternity to all of a sudden being with God, being in the presence of God forever. This was no simple thing. To them, the gospel was everything. And they didn't know how God was going to get them out of this situation, or even if he would. But what do they do? They do what they always do. They turn back to the one who had always been faithful. They chose to recenter themselves on that love relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These last two weeks, Paul has been teaching us that that's where the power of prayer comes from. It's the very heart of prayer. And they knew how to get back there. They knew how to connect to the heart of God because this had become like a well-worn path. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, like it's, it's a journey that they had made over and over and over again as they sought more intimacy, more closeness with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They had cultivated time there with the heart of God. And because they focused that time 
there with God, something incredible happens in verse 26. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. See, this is power. It's the power of God rushing in, breaking chains. The place was literally shaken in response to this tender little moment of prayer and worship. Please don't miss this. This is so, so, so important. When trouble came, when the odds were stacked against them, Paul and Silas went back to the source, and they just lingered with him. They just spent time with him. Their hearts were fully set on the Holy One, and what happened? A miracle broke out. In that opening video, Marsha said this beautifully. You know, that part where she's thinking, wait, 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 God, I, I wasn't praying for the cancer to be gone. How could I, how could I forget to be praying for the cancer to go? And, and God, in his kindness, just told her, that's what everybody else was for. And then she said this quote, you were supposed to be concentrating on me, just you and me. She said, I was supposed to be Mary at his feet, just enjoying my time with him. We talked about how there is power in the name of Jesus, but there is also power in time spent at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to say this again. There is power in time spent at the feet of Jesus. And that's what prayer and worship is. That's what Paul and Silas were doing. They were spending time just delighting in the presence of God, just returning to God. It's resting with him. It's pleading with him. It's adoring him, weeping with him, beholding him. When we center ourselves on that love relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it prepares us for bold, powerful, and dynamic prayers in a few different ways. One, it aligns our hearts with the heart of God. We start to pray for the very things that Jesus already wants to do. And it also grounds us, even when it seems that God is not moving. No, we can learn to live in this tension of both praying bold prayers, really truly believing that God can move the mountain in front of us, yet at the same time we can be willing to yield to his more perfect timing, his perspective, his sovereignty, to say, not my will, but yours be done. Time there in the heart of God fills us with boldness because we know who we are. We know whose we are. Time spent in the presence of God convinces us that we are sons and daughters of the King, that we are more than conquerors, that we are fully known and fully loved. You see, church, this is where the real power lies. It's not through impressive, flowery prayers full of theological phrases. Have you ever been in a prayer circle, right, where everybody kind of takes a turn? And, and have you ever felt that pressure of, like, everyone is going to listen to me, and everybody's going to be judging the way that I speak? And, of course, there's this guy, three people down, who just prays the most impressive prayers I've ever heard, so clearly God's going to answer that guy's prayers, and then there's me. That's not where the power is. It's not in how fancy our language is, how flowery, how, how complicated it can sound. It's in the heart. It's in that time cultivated with God. Power of God doesn't just show up when we have heavily produced worship events with the best sound, the best bands, the best lights, because if worship doesn't have the heart of God, it's nothing. It's just noise. No, the power of God can only be found in time spent with the heart of God. Again, the power of God can only be found in time spent with the heart of God. So what do you think, church? Are we ready to see a breakthrough? Do we believe, honestly, honestly, do we believe that this place can be shaken, that Jacob's well could be woken up? Do we believe that revival could break out in the Chippewa Valley, that people that are far from God, that maybe we think, oh, they're hostile to God, they would never even consider? Do we believe that the Holy Spirit could change that and we could see change here? Do we believe that it's worth it to dedicate time to prayer and to worship? Because I honestly believe, and, I, and we're seeing that the power and the presence of God is ready to rush in. He's ready to take over this place. So if you're ready, if you're feeling hungry, even if you're just curious, let's, let's, let's lean in. Let's ask God to fill us with boldness. And so let's make this practical. 
All right, we've got some next steps for you guys. 21 days of prayer, 24 hours of prayer, and Korean-style prayer. So first, today is launching our 21 days of prayer devotional. You guys can grab this at the Connection Center right after service. This is a a daily devo full of quick prayer thoughts. Uh, It has activities on different aspects of prayer. And it leads us up for the next 21 days all the way to a really special event we're about to do, uh, which is 24 hours of prayer. This is going to be April 5th and 6th. Uh, It's going to start 6 p.m. on Friday night, going to go all through the night to 6 p.m. the next day. And I honestly believe that God is about to do something incredible through this when his people really dedicate time in prayer and worship. This is going to kick off with Remnant, which is our Young Adults Ministries worship night, but we're inviting the entire church. So we want to see all y'all there. It's going to be beautiful. And then for the next 24 hours, there will be prayer leaders, there will be worship leaders, there will be worship stations around this room. Put it on your calendars. You don't want to miss this. I really believe God. is going to move in some awesome ways. But finally, each week of this series, we are trying to um, take people through different experiences of prayer to give us an opportunity to to put this into practice, all right? And this week, what we're going to do is we're going to do something called Korean-style prayer. Uh, uh, That's one name for it. Many other nationalities uh, also practice this type of prayer. But what it essentially is, is it's everybody praying out loud at the exact same time. Nobody takes turns. We all just start praying. Now, if that sounds intimidating to everybody, remember that example we just gave of being in that prayer circle and being like, ah, people are going to be judging what I have to say. No. What I love about this is everybody's praying at the same time. You ever been in a room where everybody talks at the same time? You have no idea what the person next to you is saying. And that's beautiful. It's freeing because all of a sudden you realize nobody's nobody's trying to judge me. The only person listening to me is God. And so the prayers get more honest and they get more free. And what I love is often a room will start kind of quiet and then people start to pick up some boldness and some confidence and you can feel the prayers get a little bit louder and you can start to sense the Holy Spirit just move throughout a space. One of the things I love about this imagery is this idea of every moment of every day, the Father is receiving the prayers from the entire world and from the whole heavenly host. Can you just imagine the millions, the billions of voices that are, that are hitting him at once? And we get this tiny glimpse of, of, of the united church of God just lifting up prayers to the God who can handle every one of our requests at the exact same time. The point is not to listen to one another or to feel like we need to, to speak just right to impress anybody. There's freedom here. And I want to say this too. We are already used to praying out loud all together when we sing. That's what worship is, guys. The worship choruses that we sing, they are prayers. It is claiming promises about God. It's, it's, it's understanding his character. And, and we say these things together. And so this is just another way for us to enter into prayer and worship and being bold in this. So before we begin, I want to encourage everybody. We've got a few prompts. These are different things that you could potentially be praying for. Pray for God to shake this church. Seriously, we want to see Jacob's Well be a transformative place where people are really coming to know Jesus, where our prayer lives are becoming robust, where we take him at his word. Pray for revival in the Chippewa Valley. Pray for transformation. Pray for for our, our population. Pray for our neighbors, the people we pass in the grocery store, that God would do a huge work. Pray for the pastors. We talked a lot about spiritual opposition in this message. This last week for me, I got hammered uh, with, with just attacks and just feeling just overbearing like, like, like something was trying to stop what God is doing. And thankfully, my community, much like Marsha's community, came around me and prayed for me, and all of a sudden, uh, that, was, that was freed. So pray for your pastors. We're trying to lead this church into something bold and new and beautiful, and you can better believe that the Satan does not like that. And then pray for whatever is on your heart. Just whatever God would lead you to pray for right now, do that. If you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, you want to sit. You'll notice that the people here on stage, we're also all going to be praying at once. And I encourage you, begin. And as soon as you feel a little bit of confidence and you can kind of hear that nobody's really listening to you, if you, you know, let, let's, let's really lift this up to our God. Let's let this moment of corporate prayer feel like a worship song. All right? Let's pray.
reach out to our enemies for us. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I ask that you bring peace to this place. I ask that you bring peace to the world, Lord God, with so many uh, wars and rumors of wars, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you can call a ceasefire, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Bring love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, we lift these prayers to you. Thank you that you hear us, God. Thank you that you're not far away. Would you make this a praying church? Would you make us the kind of people who take you at your word and are not afraid of the attacks of the evil one because we know that he has no real standing because the victory has already been won by you, King Jesus. In your death and in your resurrection, Satan has already been defeated. And so in the name of Jesus, we claim your power, we claim your strength, we claim your freedom over Jacob's well, over the Chippewa Valley, and we trust, God, that what you are bringing us into as a church is worth the struggle, it is worth the striving, it is worth our very best. Holy Spirit, lead us. Father, lead us. Jesus, lead us. We give you this day in your holy name. Amen.